Dr. J. Craig Venter. President and Chief Scientific Officer of Celera Genomics Corporation and founder of the Institute for Genomic Research, Tiger, Rockville, Maryland. Educated uh, by his parents, for whom he was a discipline problem, <laughs> and three years of beach surfing in Southern California, which was no problem, uh, educated by the Vietnam War, which was absolutely transformative for him. University of California at San Diego, a BA in biochemistry with honors, and a PhD in physiology and pharmacology. Educated by teaching at the University of Buffalo, researching at the National Institutes of Health. Educated by Washington bureaucracies and venture capitalists and by his own strategies for the sequencing of genes that have revolutionized the biological sciences in the 1990s. Dr. Venter has emerged as this year's Time Magazine's a scientific icon. Uh, many of you probably saw it standing there in his white lab coat with his hands on his hips. Um, he has become an American icon. I don't know what it is else you want to know about this icon. But what I know is that Dr. Vetter is brilliant, courageous, very collegial, compassionate, and generous. And it's a privilege to present him to you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Ambassador, uh, students and faculty. It's a real pleasure to be here to uh, tell you about what we're doing at the uh, forefront of at least decoding uh, genomes, including the human genome. I'd like to take you through some sort of a type of a personal journey of the last 15 years to set the stage for what we've been doing and what you'll hear from the other uh, distinguished scientist here. So if we go back to uh, 1984, 1985, uh, my lab of 20 scientists had just moved to the National Institutes of Health. I'd been working for 10 years trying to isolate the adrenaline receptor. Now, I've often thought that people study uh, diseases and genes that they have a particular interest in. Um, I don't know what drew me to the adrenaline receptor, uh, but I, I've had a fondness for it and adrenaline uh, throughout my life. Uh, after 10 years of work, we finally had enough protein to finally get a tiny bit of peptide sequence, which allowed us to clone the gene uh, for this receptor from the human brain. In fact, it was, uh, I think, the first neurotransmitter receptor cloned from the human brain. Uh, but in that first year at NIH, uh, we completely retrained ourselves in molecular biology. We decided the tools of biochemistry were not sufficient for going where we wanted to go. So we had the absolute privilege of being at NIH where we could just stop what we were doing and retrain ourselves in a new field and in doing so, uh, cloned uh, this gene. We had just finished doing this and had published uh, our paper describing the brain adrenaline receptor when uh, it became clear from the work of others that these receptor proteins were part of a very large gene family. It looks like they could be as much as five to 10% of the human genome, uh, in fact. Uh, and we were looking for ways to cater characterize this very large uh, family. When I read a very exciting paper uh, published in Nature uh, by tomorrow morning's uh, speaker, uh, Lee Hood, describing what seems like a, a simple but extremely elegant uh, approach that improved DNA sequencing immeasurably, and that was attaching four different fluorescent dyes to the four different letter bases of the genetic code, and that allowed them to be read sequentially. Uh, before that, everybody had to use these uh, uh, 
radiographic uh, methods that were extremely slow and tedious and even somewhat dangerous in terms of radiation exposure depending on who was doing the experiment. Uh, so this was a tremendous breakthrough and uh, I found the uh, company that he had licensed this technology to, Applied Biosystems, and arranged for my lab at NIH to be the first test site uh, for this new instrument. And we got the first automated DNA sequencer in February of 1987. Uh, and a few months later, published the uh, first paper in the scientific literature actually sequencing genes with this technology. Simultaneously uh, is when the first discussions about the genome project began. Uh, they began in several sources, but one principally was in the Department of Energy. Uh, I think in part trying to find uses for the national laboratories uh, for peacetime purposes. Uh, but several senior scientists, uh, uh, Professor Dobalko at the Salk Institute at the time, uh, and others uh, chimed in and thought that this was a key project. Uh, there was a lot of debate because the technology clearly didn't exist uh, for it at the time. Uh, but I was one of the few non-geneticists who got very excited about this project, uh, in part because I just spent 10 years trying to isolate one protein and one gene. And if this project had the promise over 15 or 20 years to get all of the human genes, it seemed like a fantastic scientific adventure. Uh, using the first automated sequencer, we actually produced uh, one of the first uh, sets of human genomic DNA. And it's important in terms of understanding where we are now to understand what the issues have been uh, and the changes of strategy. Initially, it was thought that only small clones, small pieces of DNA could be sequenced. At the time, the largest pieces were uh, clones called cosmids. They were about 35,000 letters. Uh, and early in 1980, uh, Fred Sanger's group published uh, the sequence of the a bacteriophage genome, uh, Lambda, which at 48,000 base pairs was the largest single sequence until in 1995 uh, we published the Haemophilus genome. Uh, and so the assumption was that you had to do this mapping stage first where these small clones were ordered, they were lined up by various methods, and only once you had the complete order would you start to sequence them. Uh, I think the project started very naively, uh, not in terms of building new technologies and new approaches, but in terms of just what tools were at hand. Uh, fortunately, it evolved quite rapidly. We started by sequencing the tip of chromosome 4, trying to find the gene that's linked to Huntington's disease. And part of chromosome 19, where there was a gene a linked to myotonic dystrophy. Uh, but what we found is even when we had these uh, very large stretches, over 100,000 base pairs of genomic sequence, our computers could not interpret this genetic code. The early assumptions were all we needed were personal computers and we would run the sequence through those and we would find all the genes as it sometimes works in bacteria. Uh, there's uh, tremendous differences between the, the uh, code of the human genome, where only about 5% of it actually codes for genes, and that of bacteria, where over 90% generally codes for genes. So it was very difficult to find these genes. In fact, one of the uh, key findings we made early on is that only by going to cDNAs, and cDNA clones are derived in our cells, uh, we make copies of the, uh, the actual gene in something that's called messenger RNA. Uh, in the heart, the heart cells find all the genes uh, linked to uh, uh, the expression in the heart. In the brain cells, we have just the messenger RNAs for genes in the brain. Uh, we decided to use the cells as our supercomputer because each cell, each of our 100 trillion cells, knows how to find the genes necessary just for that function. Uh, due to another uh, key discovery, uh, early in the history of molecular biology where uh, the enzyme reverse transcriptase was found that converts messenger RNA uh, back into DNA, and that's called complementary DNA or cDNA. 
We decided just to randomly pick a thousand clones uh, from a brain cDNA library. This is a library of the genes expressed in the brain. And we just sequenced in from the ends instead of taking time to sequence uh, the entire clones. And it was amazing to us that we made uh, hundreds of new gene discoveries in a very short period of time. Because this technique works so well, we had to name it, so it was called express sequence tags. Express because from the mRNA, we knew these were express genes. Uh, and there were tags because they were just partial sequences uh, from one or both ends of the clone. Uh, this rapidly became a dominant technique and uh, uh, we published the results of this in Science in 1991. And at the time, so this paper described 337 new genes in the human brain. At the time, this is just the start of this decade, out of the estimated approximately 100,000 human genes, we knew the structure of less than 2,000. So you stop and think of all the medicine, all the knowledge that we have, it's ignoring almost all of the molecular biology of our own uh, bodies. The human brain, there were only two dozen genes known. So even though this seems like a very small number to us now, adding 337 uh, in a few weeks was a uh, major uh, advance. A few weeks later, uh, we published a paper in Nature describing over 2,000 uh, new genes. And this technique has gone on now about 73% of all the genes in the public databases uh, are from the EST method. This is a statistical method, and it can discover a great percentage of the genes in a complex species such as our own, but it can't discover all of them. The other problem is back when we were trying to put together these pieces of DNA, uh, one key fact is the sequencing machines can only read around five to 600 letters of genetic code. So if you want to sequence something that's a million letters long or three billion letters long, you have to come up with different strategies. The one that was uh, came, uh, derived out of the NIH program was to try and sequence these small clones, but to sequence a small cosmic clone, you had to sequence a thousand fragments and try and put those back together again. And that was sort of the limitation of our computers and the software at the time, was to deal with a thousand pieces of DNA. All of a sudden with ESTs, we had first thousands, then tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and now millions of sequences that we wanted to congeal uh, in the computer to represent the unique set of human genes. So one of the biggest breakthroughs uh, that we came up with uh, in, in forming a tiger uh, was uh, new mathematical algorithms that allowed us to deal with large numbers of sequences. I left NIH in 1992 and formed the Institute for Genomic Research. Uh, the initial acronym was uh, uh, just IGR, which uh, we read to be Igor. Um, and we were concerned about the bad press we were already getting. Uh, <laughs> So my wife and colleague, uh, Claire Frazier, suggested we add the article in front and make it Tigger uh, after Winnie the Pooh, uh, thinking that would help until a, a French reporter came to interview me. And he said, you named it Tiger to be particularly aggressive against the French, didn't you? Uh, and I said, yes, of course. Uh, and it's been Tiger ever since. Um, but what we did at Tiger is we made cDNA libraries from uh, about 300 major organs and tissues uh, and sequenced hundreds of thousands of these EST clones. Uh, we spent a year and a half analyzing the data and wrote up a 200-page manuscript and submitted it to Nature. Now, this is only unusual uh, in the sense if you understand that Nature never publishes a paper longer than five pages. Uh, so the, the editor was uh, very distraught over this, uh, but finally decided to publish the first ever special issue of Nature uh, with this paper in it, and asked us for some art for the cover. And we suggested uh, uh, this drawing that you see here. Uh, but the then editor of Nature thought this was far too graphic for the readers of Nature. Uh, and I hope at least some of the students of biology have noticed what the problem is, is that this is actually a hermaphrodite. I at least hope somebody here noticed that. 
and, and what it turns out is the nature editor was concerned about confusing the physicists that read nature. <laughs> so he asked if we could come up with some tamer uh, artwork. Uh, we, we found an Italian artist to help us. Uh, <laughs> Now, I thought this had too many arms and legs, uh, uh, but it seemed to be uh, acceptable. Uh, in this paper, in this special issue that was published in 1995, we described uh, ESTs that collapsed into maybe 35,000 human genes. But of those, we can only put names on about 10,000, because most of them were new and didn't match anything that had been seen before uh, in biology. Uh, but it was a dramatic change in four years from the 2,000 genes that we had in the database when we started. Well, we were reflecting when this was coming out on what we could use these dramatic new tools for and how we could go back and come up with new approaches for the human genome and others. And my friend and colleague, uh, Ham Smith, who uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1978 for discovering restriction endonucleases, the molecular scissors that cut DNA at very precise, recognized points, suggested that we sequence the genome of E. coli, where we actually try the experiment instead of creating a map of the clones up front, is that we just take this entire chromosome out of the uh, bacteria uh, break it apart, uh, sequence the little pieces, and try to use our mathematical algorithms and our computers to try and solve this jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Ham and I wrote a grant and submitted it to NIH proposing that we would sequence uh, not E. coli because it was being funded and it was in its, I think, eighth year of funding at that time uh, from NIH. The first three years were just created, uh, it was spent creating a clone map of E. coli. And we said, we, we decided to choose Haemophilus influenza. Ham Smith had spent a lot of his career on it. He isolated the first restriction endonucleases from it. It's a key human pathogen being one of the major causes of meningitis. Uh, and it's one of the few bacteria that children are actually uh, vaccinated against. Uh, we, we proposed we would use this method, uh, but we were skeptical that we would get funding. Fortunately, we had money in the endowment at Tiger that we decided to use. And we had the project about 90% completed when we got word from the NIH uh, that our project was impossible and they weren't going to fund it. Um, and just a, a few months later, uh, we published the first genome for a free living organism uh, in the journal Science. Uh, even though this was not our intention when we started this, it was just a basic science experiment to see if these techniques would work. Seeing the first complete genome really transformed my own thinking in terms of knowing that we had to have the complete genetic code of virtually every species that we were working with because it was tr such a tremendous difference in what we could do with this information. Uh, the circles you see here, uh, the ba many bacteria have a circular chromosome and the different colored bands that you see going around the edge uh, represent the different uh, genes and the different function by color coding in the genome. Uh, we also have uh, linear maps uh, that allow this uh, to be interpreted more easily. I, I could talk for the next uh, several hours just on all the findings that came out of this single genome, but I think the one uh, that affected me the most was in front of all the genes associated with creating the cell surface antigens uh, for example, enzymes associated with lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis, uh, iron transporters, uh, anything that was expressed on the cell surface had in front of those sequences a unique piece of genetic code uh, that it was a repeat of four letters of the genetic code. Richard Moxon at Oxford had found this in front of one gene and proposed that this was a novel mechanism for antigenic variation that every time DNA polymerase uh, passed over this, one in 10,000 times there would be an error and it would shift the genetic sequence so that you actually got a different protein or a stop codon was put in and you got no protein expressed. What was found is that we found these, as I said, in, in front of almost every key cell surface uh, uh, gene and enzyme controlling cell surface molecules. 
And what it became clear is what Darwin proposed in evolution, that it was just a random error uh, system, uh, you know, just random chance or variation is not quite correct. And now that we've done dozens of uh, key human pathogens, we found these mechanisms, one type or another, in every single genome, where basically it's pre-programmed into the genetic code to have variation. So genomes are not static. That's the reason virtually everybody in this room has haemophilus influenza in your airways. It's evolving in real time, fooling our immune systems, uh, changing its cell surface antigens, and surviving. Real time evolution through these pre-programmed mechanisms. When we were looking at these genomes, we, we, we found there were roughly 1,800 genes. And uh, Ham and I were having a little celebration when the science paper came out. And it was sort of a time for true confessions. And I said, you know, Ham, I, I have to confess. I'm, I'm really glad you understood all this, because uh, I didn't. Uh, he said, me, I thought you understood it all. Uh, and what we decided as a genome with 1,800 genes was beyond either of our mental capacities to understand how they all work together to form a living cell. And so there are several choices open to us. Uh, we could do what happened with the yeast genome once it was finished a few years later, where yeast researchers around the world are doing knockouts where they take out one gene at a time to try and see whether, uh, what that does to the function. We decided to look for a, a simpler biological answer, and we found an organism uh, being characterized by Clyde Hutchinson in North Carolina called Mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, this is a, a picture of it here, where it attaches to human cells by a small a foot. Uh, Clyde had indicated that this genome was probably the smallest for any free-living organism uh, seen. And we decided it would be a great one to sequence the genome of. Uh, I don't know if this shows up. These are two different views of mycoplasma genitalium, one an electron micrograph and one a Gary Larson cartoon. Um, it says, hey, I've got news for you, sweetheart. I am the lowest life form on Earth. Uh, we, we decided this was a great opportunity to study uh, the basis of life. Uh, Claire Fraser led the team that sequenced this genome. It took only three months to decode it. And this is the genetic map. There's 470 genes uh, in this chromosome. Um, and so uh, upon finishing this, we immediately asked, well, how can it live with 470 genes and Haemophilus needs 1,800 and we need about 100,000? Is 470 really the smallest number that's needed for life? Uh, it turns out there's a lot of things that happen in evolution. There was a second mycoplasma that was sequenced a, a, a few months later, mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, associated with walking pneumonia, uh, that is slightly larger. Uh, it has about uh, 680 genes. But one interesting finding was all the genes that were in mycoplasma genitalium had counterparts in mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia genome uh, was just roughly 200 genes bigger than genitalium. So sometimes evolution works particularly with pathogens by these organisms throwing out DNA as they form a symbiotic relation. Both these organisms are uh, human pathogens. Uh, basically everybody uh, uh, in this room has uh, both these mycoplasmas associated uh, uh, with our physiologies, uh, and so they derive from a much larger gram-positive organism with as many as 5,000 genes by throwing out genetic material, for example, as they developed in uh, concert with our bodies to provide the key nutrients that they needed. We decided this was a perfect test bed for evolution, and uh, we started a project on transposon insertion. What transposons are there? Uh, like small uh, viruses that can insert randomly in the genetic code. But because we had the complete genetic sequence, uh, we could work out exactly where each of these insertions took place. So we could create a map of the uh, genome. And the assumption was is that the 200 extra genes in pneumonia should be all knocked out without killing the organism. Uh, it turned out uh, that was the case. 
Uh, we sequenced about a thousand uh, junctions from each of these species, and we found that we could disrupt uh, uh, a significant number of genes in each of these. To make a very long story short, we got down to around 300 genes that we decided were probably essential for life because we couldn't uh, knock those out and keep a viable uh, species in the laboratory. And looking at the functions of these different genes uh, was really stunning to us. Uh, genes associated with uh, energy metabolism, uh, translation, replication, uh, transcription, things part of the basic cellular machinery, most of these genes were essential and we couldn't knock them out. Two different groups, uh, the unknown class, which represented about a quarter of the genes in this genome, uh, we could knock out roughly half of them, but there was 103 genes that we have no idea what they do in biology that prove to be essential for life. Uh, the other category was ones associated with the cell envelope, things associated with antigenic variation that should be variable. But I think this was a very stunning finding to us that out of the 300 genes for creating the smallest living organism that we can conceive of at the present time, one third of those genes we have no idea whatsoever what the biological function is. So it's beginning to emerge that our philosophy developed that the exploration of genomics became a very humbling experience proving how little we actually know about biology of any species let alone the uh, most uh, simple and minimal ones. Well, the third genome we decoded came from an unusual uh, source. Uh, this is the research uh, submersible Alvin out of Woods Hole that went to uh, this black smoker uh, off the coast of Mexico, a mile and a half deep in the ocean. The temperature in the center of this plume is about 400 degrees centigrade. The surrounding water is about two degrees centigrade. The Alvin broke off a piece of this chimney right here, took the samples back to Woods Hole, and this bug was isolated out of that chimney wall. It was named Methanococcus unasii after Holger Janisch, the expedition leader. Uh, and this is a true autotroph that has some very unusual properties, at least unusual relative to our human-centric view of, of life. Uh, at our body temperatures, this organism is frozen solid. Uh, it comes to life about 60 degrees centigrade. It's happiest at 85 degrees centigrade, but it can absolutely survive and be happy in boiling water. The other thing this organism does, it takes this carbon dioxide and hydrogen and makes everything it needs for life. It's called an autotroph. It doesn't need sugar. It doesn't need to bring in amino acids. It makes everything just from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Well, a few years ago, this sounded like something that would have come from outer space, uh, not something that might be ubiquitous on this planet. And when we decoded this genome and published the results uh, in science in 1996, the biggest discovery was over 50% of the genes in this species didn't match anything we'd seen before. And there were whole sets of genes in a row uh, called operons which we assume code for whole new physiologies that we don't have the slightest clue about uh, that we found uh, embedded in these uh, chromosomes. Uh, this changed our view of the world. Mycoplasma and Haemophilus had a lot of genes in common, and we began to think that the uh, Earth's gene pool might be a lot smaller than we had expected. Uh, this very dramatically changed our views, and it's uh, only grown exponentially uh, since that time. The initial plans from NIH and DOE was to determine the genetic code of only one bacteria, that is the laboratory uh, tool E. coli. And it was thought that all of the microbial world looked alike um, and we didn't need to do any more species. Well, we're in, clearly in an exponential growth phase since we published the first two in 1995 in terms of the number of different uh, bacterial species and microorganisms that are now being decoded. And just a few months ago, the American Society for Microbiologists had a meeting on microbial genomics and decided that we now need to do at least 500 microbial genomes just to get a hint of what's out there. Uh, and that each one of these genomes is providing such tremendous new information uh, that it's stunning everybody. I'll give you a few more examples. 
Deinococcus radiodurans was isolated in the 1950s by the attempts to irradiate meat uh, for sterilization. And regardless of the dose of radiation used, a red pigmented bacteria kept growing out of this. Uh, it turns out this organism can take phenomenal doses of radiation, up to three million rads of radiation. Uh, I was showing this to the Department of Defense, and I said this was their data on humans, and this was E. coli, uh, and a lot of people look very embarrassed. These were both different bacteria. Uh, so I think somebody did that experiment once. Um, but these are phenomenal doses of radiation, and what happens is the chromosome gets blown apart. Here's two glass beakers uh, this is after about a half million rads of radiation. The beaker started to burn and crack and melt, but the bacteria in the bottom just kept happily replicating and saying, you know, could you turn up the heat a little bit, please? <laughs> the chromosome gets blown apart into hundreds of little fragments that miraculously, over 12 to 24 hours, it stitches these fragments back together to reform its chromosome, and it starts replicating again. Uh, I think this is one of the most amazing uh, processes we've ever seen. And you can, you can ask, well, why would an organism evolve, uh, particularly before atomic energy, to survive millions of rads of radiation? Well, the other key fact about this organism is completely desiccant resistance. It, it's been found ubiquitously on the planet. It's been found on granite surfaces in Antarctica, completely dried out. And we think both the process of desiccation and absorbing doses, cumulative doses, of ionizing radiation over a long period of time uh, are probably linked uh, biologically. Uh, Francis Crick and others have proposed uh, panspermia as the origin of life on Earth. That means life came in from some other uh, planet uh, or some other part of the universe uh, and established itself here. This organism would be a great candidate for panspermia uh, because it can absorb huge doses of radiation. It could survive a space environment. Uh, it would reach an aqueous source, stitch its genome back together, and start replicating again. But don't get too surprised when you hear Dan Golden uh, announce that they discovered Deinococcus radiodurans in outer space, uh, because every time they flush the commode on the space station or the uh, shuttle, uh, millions, if not billions, of copies get launched into outer space. Uh, and it's definitely out there uh, floating around and uh, uh, will come back at some stage. Uh, I think one of the most exciting projects is coming up with the attempt to uh, intercept uh, a, a meteor, uh, a comet tail, uh, to see if there's any microbes uh, in the uh, frozen uh, ice. Uh, this genome has just been decoded and it actually has three chromosomes in a plasmid. Uh, which was a very different structure than scientists studying this uh, did, uh, assumed it had. And uh, the different chromosomes contain genes associated with different functions, uh, leading us to believe that this evolved through some unusual steps uh, in evolution. Well, uh, earlier this year, we published a paper describing the genome of Thermotoga maritima. Uh, this is the Carl Woese evolutionary tree showing the assumed three branches of life that were in fact confirmed by our sequencing of uh, Methanococcus, at least at some level. The thermatogas are one of the most deeply uh, rooted uh, bacteria, and it's thought to represent a truly ancient bacteria, so we decided it would be a great genome uh, to decode. What we found on decoding this genome was in fact a lot of the genes look like they came from the archaea through a process called lateral gene transfer. Uh, I don't know if this shows up or not, but there are whole cassettes of genes that you can see uh, with the gene order and the sequence highly conserved between archaeal species and bacterial species. And we think this is a very key part of evolution. Evolution is not just mother-to-daughter transmission. Uh, organisms are constantly exchanging DNA and unusual mechanisms uh, with viruses, with other uh, mechanisms. And I think this is the first very clear-cut evidence of this. And so I don't think we're going to end up with an evolutionary tree. I think it's going to become something like a neural network with cross branches everywhere, uh, making it quite difficult to deconvolute. But having all the genetic codes, I think, will help a lot. In terms of pathogens, we've now decoded a number of pathogens. 
Uh, I'm going to show you a few just to show you the kinds of information that's coming out of these. Uh, tuberculosis is one of the uh, leading causes of death of adults uh, in the world. There's over 3 million annual deaths, but there's a large pool of close to 2 billion individuals with latent TB, up to one-third of the population, and TB seems to be coming back. Uh, a couple years ago, the CDC tracked a very unusual case of tuberculosis uh, uh, in uh, Tennessee uh, at a clothing factory uh, where the index case was a 21-year-old male. Uh, it's not clear where he contracted TB, but in a very short period of time, all his family members, 75% of his co-workers, and 80% of his social contacts became skin test positive, and uh, many of them developed uh, tuberculosis. Uh, this is one of the most virulent in terms of transmissible TBs uh, ever seen. Fortunately, it was fully drug sensitive, but treating tuberculosis is not a simple thing to do. Uh, and had this 21-year-old uh, clothing factory worker been working at a major department store in New York, we might have a new TB pandemic underway right now. So we decided this was a great strain of tuberculosis to decode its genome, uh, particularly because uh, the Pasteur Institute and Sanger Institute in England were decoding uh, the genome of, of a laboratory strain of TB. What we found really surprised us. It turned out this uh, so-called uh, Oshkosh strain actually had many more genes than the normally uh, understood tuberculosis. In fact, we found some mechanisms. Tuberculosis is characterized by the number of these insertion elements that insert into the genome. And here there's two quite close together that look like as it is inserted, it caused three of these genes that are in the Oshkosh strain to be spliced out. But there's a finite number of these, and so now we can go to the computer and we have a number of very clear-cut testable hypotheses whether any of these genes are associated with a tremendous increase in transmissibility of this new uh, TB. But the other thing that became clear to us because it has more genes is this is probably not a new strain of tuberculosis, but an ancient strain that's re-emerging. Uh, this is uh, the uh, tick, the deer tick that carries uh, the Lyme disease spirochete. This is the first spirochete uh, that was decoded. And again, the type of hypothesis that we can generate out of having the complete genome decoded and having the metabolic pathways is we can come up with at least potential new uh, therapies. One of the unusual things when this spirochete is grown in culture, it requires very high concentrations of a chemical called N-acetylglucosamine. And what we had found is on the surface of the cell, a transporter that transmits uh, dimers of N-acetylglucosamine into the cell. And we're trying to understand the biological relevance of this until we decide, you know, realize that the tick host is basically a walking grocery store for N-acetylglucosamine. Chitin, the entire exoskeleton, is a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine. So scientists now at Yale and other places are seeing if they can just block this transporter to see if it would disrupt the entire life cycle of this key pathogen. Uh, and so we're anxiously waiting those results. Even it turns out that it's not effective as, as a therapeutic, it shows the power of starting with the computer uh, going forward. Malaria is not uh, a bacteria, it's a eukaryote uh, similar to uh, our own genomes. And this slide shows the spread of drug-resistant malaria over the last several decades to the point now where traveling in some parts of the world, uh, you're really taking your uh, life into your own hands uh, because of potential death from malaria. The U.S. military realized that and realized that in the first few months of sending, if not the first few weeks, of sending troops to some of these areas, it could result in as many as one-third of their troops as casualties uh, from uh, mosquito bites because of drug-resistant malaria. The malaria genome was thought to be non-sequenceable because it has a very unusual abundance of just the letters A and T. Uh, in fact, the malaria community had trouble cloning genes and the notion was that it was, it was going to be non-decipherable. We decided to do an experiment by isolating chromosome 2 out of a gel 
and doing whole genome shotgun on this to see if it was in fact sequenceable. But because there were no genetic maps, we had to use some unusual tools. Uh, several groups have developed techniques where they can get single molecules of DNA on glass slides. Shown here is a single molecule of chromosome 2 from malaria. What was found with these single chromosomes on these glass sides, you could treat them with restriction enzymes and the enzymes would still cut. So what's seen here is these gaps are where the enzyme cut because there's surface tension on the glass, the ends would pull away. And so we could amazingly do restriction digest maps of single molecules of chromosomes. And we use this information uh, to verify the final structure that we ended up with and published this uh, last year in Science. Uh, this is probably impossible to see, but this is a, a lower eukaryote. Uh, a lot of the genes are broken up with introns, about 40% of them. Uh, and you'll see as we look at higher and higher species, we see more of these introns, which allows more and more genetic variation to take place. Uh, at Tiger, the first uh, plant chromosome has now been completed. This is from the International Project to sequence the Arabidopsis uh, genome. Uh, there's five uh, chromosomes. Based on genetic maps, it was thought that chromosome two was the smallest. When we actually sequenced it, it ended up being a lot uh, larger uh, than was anticipated. And now a European group has just about finished chromosome four, and these two uh, chromosomes will probably be published together uh, later this year. These chromosomes resemble our own chromosomes in terms of having centromeres and telomeres at both ends. And for the first time, we're able to scan along and look at the, uh, the DNA content and the gene density. And here in the centromere, the gene density goes way down, but it's pretty uniform along the chromosome. But these random insertion elements go way up in the centromeric region. Uh, but amazingly, we still found uh, key genes in the centromeric region, even though they were far uh, lower density. For example, an RNA uh, helicase uh, was a key gene that was found early in this region. One of the surprises we found in sequencing this chromosome uh, was that there was a complete copy of the mitochondrial genome inserted into the Arabidopsis chromosome. We thought at first this was an artifact, but we could sequence off uh, both ends of this uh, mitochondrial insertion and prove that it was actually inserted into the chromosome. What this graph shows is that it, if it was an exact match, you would see just one solid line of identity. What happens is the, uh, the chromosome underwent rearrangements. And again, we think of chromosomes as being static entities, but it turns out mitochondria uh, rapidly rearrange. We don't know if this is a functional copy of the mitochondria that's actually in the chromosomes, but it's typical. Every genome we look at, every chromosome, we find uh, some absolutely amazing findings. Well, we were thinking that we were able to deal with a wide range of genomes from very high content of Gs and Cs, which people thought would be non-sequenceable, to very low content of Gs and Cs, which people thought would be non-sequenceable. And all these worked extremely well with the whole genome shotgun method. And we were looking to expand this to larger species, but we're waiting for a technology breakthrough. Also with this slide, this is a summary of all the gene finding and all the different genomes sequenced. And this is a very humbling number. I don't know if people can read it. It says 47% on average of the genes found in each of these genomes are totally new to science. We've never seen them before, and we don't have any idea what they do. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a tremendous uh, process going forward. Mike Hunkepiller at Applied Biosystems. Uh, Mike came from Lee Hood's lab uh, to form Applied Biosystems. Uh, and developed uh, three more generations before this uh, latest machine. And he called me about a year ago and said he had a fantastic breakthrough uh, in the DNA sequencing machines. Uh, and would I come out and look at it? Because in addition, they were thinking of putting up uh, 300 or so million dollars uh, to sequence the human genome. Um, you don't get asked twice for those things. So I decided to go out and uh, uh, look. Uh, and was absolutely amazed with the technology that they had developed. Uh, all the other machines needed tremendous manual uh, intervention. This was the first truly automated uh, sequencing machine that can run 24 hours a day. 
basically, instead of a gel, it has these very fine capillaries. They're only 50 microns in internal diameter that the, uh, a liquid gel gets pumped into these, and the gel helps separate the DNA one molecule at a time uh, in a size ladder. And the DNA with the fluorescent dyes that Lee Hood uh, initially developed flow off the end of the capillaries into solution, where a laser beam shines through that solution, activating all the dyes simultaneously, where the genetic code is read into the computer. Uh, we like this enough, so uh, we got a number of these. Um, these little boxes cost $300,000 each, uh, and uh, we ordered 300 of them, um, and have set up uh, the largest sequencing factory in the world uh, by quite a bit. Uh, but the amazing thing, due to all, all the automation, is the only uh, about 50 people required to do all this work, uh, in contrast to a year ago, it would have required over 1,000 people. Um, it requires a very large amount of air conditioning and a large amount of uh, electricity uh, a day. But I think one of the things you'll see in a minute on, on a video is the most important thing we've built is the world's second largest supercomputer facility, which is what we need to interpret this genetic code. Uh, it's such a huge calculation. Uh, it requires so much compute power uh, that even with uh, these tremendous uh, number of the new uh, compact uh, alpha processors, uh, I think we're still going to be computationally limited, even though we can do over 250 billion of these complex comparisons per hour uh, per chip. If I could have the video, please. This video is just going to show a, a, a few of the key players and uh, and some of the facilities. Let's go to the videotape. <laughs> okay. This works so well this morning when we tried it. So what you see behind me, this is uh, Ham Smith uh, along uh, uh, with his assistant, Cindy. Uh, they are the first step in this critical process. Ham's a remarkable scientist. He's never had a technician in his entire career. He's always done his own work with his own hands. And that's why he's the best in the world at, at what he does. And handling the large samples of DNA to make these critical libraries is an essential part of what we do. These are robotic devices that pick 10,000 clones an hour with only pe three people that do uh, all the work. Uh, each of these little bacteria contain one piece of human DNA uh, that we then uh, prepare uh, in the laboratory for sequencing. We have a small number of people uh, and we have these robotic uh, workstations. We have, uh, I think, approximately 150 of them that each one has uh, these pipette heads uh, that deals with 384 samples uh, at a time. Uh, there's machine reading, there's barcode reading, uh, there's cameras on them that track every step. This is just one day's worth of 384 well plates. Uh, it costs about $250,000 a day to run this facility, uh, and it's a very large number of samples uh, processed uh, by a very small uh, and dedicated team. Here you can see the room uh, full of uh, these uh, robots. Uh, they do every step. These are the PCR machines uh, based on the work of Kerry Mullis. We can copy the DNA and uh, everything is part of the amplification process. This is the robot arm on the sequencer where it automatically loads the samples uh, into the gel. Uh, we cover the samples with foil and it pierces them just to load the ones it needs at a time uh, so we don't get oxidation. So we have, uh, you'll see in a minute, a giant room full of these machines, but just only a handful of people that go through and do quality uh, checking and quality uh, control work. Here's Ham Smith, uh, who wanders through the lab all day long, trying to make sure people do a good job uh, with the libraries that he's made. Uh, everything's digitized, everything's computerized. Uh, uh, this doesn't show up well, but that's uh, the genetic code of, of these machines. 
Each one of these boxes you see costs around $300,000. Each one has a laser in it, and so the air conditioning in this room uh, would probably uh, uh, be enough to cool any uh, major uh, complex of buildings uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, what you see is a lot of machines all working, uh, and you only occasionally see people uh, that tend to them, add solutions, uh, check the data, uh, and check the samples on them. This is the main sequencing lab. We have four labs. This one holds uh, 200 of uh, the DNA uh, sequencers uh, and generates about four terabytes of data uh, every 24 hours. Uh, the biggest challenge is dealing with the data flow uh, out of this operation. Uh, we switched to optical fibers on each floor uh, and the data from these machines is fed over to our computer facility. Uh, this is an optical fiber network uh, out to our computers this is the new uh, ES40 uh, computer. Each one of these has uh, four of the new EB6 Alpha chip. The entire Library of Congress can be held on just four of those uh, disk boxes. So I think you can see it's a very unusual facility. It's an unusual biological facility in terms of, of doing uh, high throughput. Well, what are we doing with this? Uh, over the first few years, uh, we plan to finish the genome of the fruit fly Drosophila, the human genome, and the mouse genome. Uh, we also are potentially uh, sequencing the rice genome and we'll be incorporating the Arabidopsis genome. Why these five genomes? Uh, Drosophila is the first insect, uh, and insects not only have a huge impact on, on disease, uh, but also cause billions of dollars of crop damage a year. Rice and Arabidopsis are the two model organisms that cover as many as 250,000 different plants, and we'll be able to lay your additional genomes on top of these two base genomes. Any additional insects will be able to lay on top of the Drosophila genome. Mouse is absolutely essential for understanding uh, the human genome, uh, as, as many key scientists have shown. In fact, uh, this shows the, the color-coded human chromosomes uh, overlaid with the mouse chromosome. So even though they don't correspond one for one uh, because of recombination, uh, basically you can cover the entire mouse genome by layering the bits of the chromosomes on top of human, and that's what we'll do with this process. We can go from biology in the fruit fly, the PAC6 gene. Uh, if you have mutations in that gene in Drosophila, it leads to an eyeless phenotype. Mutations in the same gene in mouse uh, leads to a blind uh, mice, uh, maybe three of them. Um, uh, mutations in the Pax6 gene in humans lead to a disease called aniridia, uh, where these children are actually born without an iris, so they can't regulate the amount of light going into their eyes, and they usually end up going blind at a very early stage. Uh, in every case, can we rely on data from the flu fruit fly or the mouse? No, but I think in most cases uh, we can. Uh, the Drosophila genome, which we announced, we completed the sequencing phase a little over a month ago, uh, is one of the most important models uh, in all of biology. The history of Drosophila genetics is the history of human genetics, basically. The first genetic maps uh, were generated in Drosophila at the start of this century, and those techniques have been copied uh, into human. Now, when we sequenced the Haemophilus genome, which was 1.8 million base pairs, we had to sequence about 26,000 clones. It took us about four months at Tiger to do that with about 24 staff. And we had one person, Granger Sutton, who developed the key algorithms for assembling that data. With what we just finished in Drosophila, the genome is 77 times bigger. We had to sequence over 3 million clones. It only took four months uh, with a staff of about 40 people but the number of algorithm specialists has expanded uh, substantially. Uh, Granger Sutton came over from Tiger, and Gene Myers came in from the University of Arizona to hold up our, hold up our uh, algorithm development team. We've now compared the assembly of Drosophila against the known map of Drosophila, and out of 1,700 uh, STS markers, we found only 12 discrepancies. The first thing Jerry Rubin, our collaborator at Berkeley, said when he saw this is he didn't realize his map was that good. Uh, more importantly, we compared the sequence that we generated to about 22 million base pairs that had already been sequenced by the Berkeley group. 
And out of all the matches, there was only one discrepancy. Uh, Reuben went back to his lab and they checked the clone and found that they had an error in that clone. It was actually a chimeric clone uh, that had rearranged. And now we're down to zero discrepancies between our mathematical uh, assembly and what had been done a clone uh, at a time. Drosophila, as I mentioned earlier, is a key model for human disease genes. If you look at 110 human disease genes on the NIH website, uh, the biggest number of matches is to Drosophila. 73 of them have counterparts in Drosophila, 52 in C. elegans, and 25 uh, in yeast. So I think uh, uh, Drosophila is going to have a huge importance. Now, the shotgun sequencing model, what most people don't realize is you get most of the data uh, very early in the process. Uh, after 3x coverage, we essentially have uh, the entire genome. 3x means we've sequenced the genome uh, an average of three times. The key basis of how the mathematics works, and, it, and it's remarkably simple in concept, in execution it's a little bit more complicated, is we decided to sequence two different size clones of DNA, those that are 2,000 letters long and those that are 10,000 letters long. And one of the key features is we sequence 600 letters in uh, from both ends. Uh, in addition, we have both ends uh, from uh, back clones that are 150,000 letters long uh, from the uh, Berkeley uh, project. And in human, we have those from the Tiger effort and the effort in Lee Hood's lab uh, doing back end sequencing, uh, a method that uh, Lee Hood uh, co described with me. Uh, a key assumption with this, because you have probably read everybody thought the repeats in the human and other genomes would totally foil this process. And I, I credit Gene Myers with this, as he realized if you just ignore the problems, we can fundamentally put 99.7% of the genome together without even worrying about the repeats. So the philosophy was to concentrate first on what we knew and we could easily solve, and when that number is 99.7%, uh, it, it was pretty good. Uh, the key part are these mated pairs uh, from all the clones. Uh, in addition, for joining the scaffold, we require two different sets of these mates, which means that there's one chance in 10 to the 15th that we would make an error if we require uh, this type of scaffolding. Uh, an assembly progression uh, actually goes together very quickly. I don't know how well it shows up here. Uh, that's 8x, 9x, 10x coverage. We're at 10x coverage before we do any other work right out of the computer. Essentially, the entire chromosome uh, is ordered. Now, with the human genome, we're going up a little bit in size to about 3.5 billion letters. We have to do 64 million sequences in contrast to 3 million for Drosophila. And we think it's going to take us on the order of uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, with a staff of only 50 people, and we've added a few more people to the algorithm group. But you've heard now the changes in the public program, uh, which we consider very complementary to what we're doing, and you've heard this term draft sequence. Well, draft sequence equals gene discovery, and a very important part of shotgun sequencing is between zero and one X coverage, we get essentially 100% of the genes uh, that are multiple exon genes and it's not far behind even for single exon genes. Uh, we're going to make the two processes go together. Our plan is uh, very aggressive. We expect to have one X coverage of the human genome by December of this year. We're close to that goal already. Uh, that'll give us 67% of the genome and about 90% of the genes. By early spring and March, we'll have 90% of the genome covered. Uh, and by April, we'll have over 97% of it covered. Uh, the public effort is working on the clone-by-clone clone approach where they hope to have partial coverage of a large number of back clones covering the genome. And what we found is that we can put these two together and we think move up the timeline for having the human genome sequence completed to some time in next year. Uh, this is what draft sequence looks like from a bacterial artificial chromosome. You have a number of different sized pieces, all less than 20,000 letters, where the goal is to get it all put together in 150,000 letters. If we add that to that just one X coverage of our data, it shifts the spectrum very dramatically in the size of the assemblies. At 2X, 
almost all the backs are ordered uh, completely. Laying over the data we'll have by April on top of the public data is we will have every single back uh, completely uh, ordered uh, and sequenced with only occasional sequence gaps uh, for some uh, repeats. This is what the two ends give you in the computer. They actually give you all these scaffolds that span the repeat areas, uh, and so it's not a problem. Uh, and if you, it's hard to imagine how you could have 60 million of these links, uh, but I think it gives you some sort of intuitive feeling for how this will go together. So we expect in the year 2000, we will have a complete uh, sequence of the human genome, minus the regions that everybody's ignoring uh, like the telomeres, the centromeres, and the ribosomal operon regions that are being ignored uh, by all the projects. Another key advantage from the whole genome shotgun sequencing, we're taking the complete DNA out of sperm and white blood cells from five different individuals. And just sequencing one individual because you get one set of chromosomes from your mother and one from your father, those sets of chromosomes differ in about three million letters of genetic code from each other. So roughly one in a thousand letters are different. So just sequencing one individual, we would end up with about three million polymorphisms or single nucleotide polymorphisms if you've heard them referred to as SNPs. In addition, comparing just one individual to the public data would give us more than six million uh, SNPs in our database. Uh, and if we do all five individuals, we'll have on the order of, of 20 million variations. And I think this is going to be one of the most important facts that come out of uh, sequencing the human genome, is understanding individual genetic variation. Uh, we're hopeful that it's going to be the key basis uh, for the future of medicine, leading to individualized medicine, leading to the empowerment of individuals uh, with knowledge over your own uh, genetic code, uh, allowing you to deal with preventative medicine uh, paradigms. Uh, we think the importance going forward is understanding the logic of the genome. Uh, we have a hundred trillion different cells. Each of those cells has the same genetic code, but each of those cells expresses different genes dynamically in real time. So comparative genomics is what we learn from the microbial genome that the only way we're going to understand the human genome is to have a large number of other genomes uh, to compare to it to help understand it. We've had a very narrow view of biology. We've been dealing with this dogma that there was one gene, one protein, one function, one disease. And that just doesn't hold up anymore. This was like looking under the lamppost uh, for your lost keys. Uh, there was a major news announcement in 1989 uh, where teams headed by Lep Chi Choi in Toronto and Francis Collins in Michigan found the so-called cystic fibrosis gene. And then that, since that time, there's been hundreds and hundreds of studies published characterizing spelling differences in that chloride ion channel linking it to cystic fibrosis. But last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a series of articles published showing that the same spelling changes in the same gene can lead to multiple medical outcomes. You can have cystic fibrosis and all these different diseases, or you can have just chronic lung disease, just male infertility, just asthma, just chronic pancreatitis, just chronic liver disease, or more disturbing of all to most people is a large number of these people had no apparent illness whatsoever. If we're asking for too simplistic of an answer, we're going to get fooled like this. Uh, with the dynamic changes that take place as we go from a single cell to 100 trillion cells with all these genes interacting, we're all going to be different in key and subtle ways. This is going to be important in terms of uh, whether you're the, one of the 60% of the population that most drugs help versus the 40% that they don't help or actually even toxic to. With cancer chemotherapy, only 30% of the patients respond to any therapeutic regimen. Uh, if we can predict who in advance will respond and who won't, uh, I think it'll result in a major change in medicine. One example is most people think if you take a baby aspirin a day, uh, it'll uh, save uh, you from having the side effects from a heart attack or a stroke. It turns out that's only true for one out of three individuals. But because it affects so many people, everybody's told to do it, uh, particularly by the aspirin manufacturers. Um, 
I, it may be a trivial example, uh, but understanding your own genetic code and your genetic differences will help you to understand whether you're one of those uh, three or the literally millions of other examples uh, that will come up. Uh, I think the impact of having these sequences is going to be a new starting point in biology and medicine. It's not an end point on its own. We view it as the starting point for what we hope to do. Every technique that's ever existed in biology will come back to be absolutely uh, essential. And you're going to hear, obviously, uh, in, in many of the uh, following talks, particularly from uh, Dean Hamer, about genes and behavior. We're going to start to understand uh, the genetic basis of traits, uh, personality, intelligence. Uh, we'll be able to really get down to the issues of nature versus nurture. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very exciting ride. Uh, there's a few caveats to throw in there uh, that I'm going to end with. Uh, I don't think it's far away before we're going to have uh, this United States Department of Genetic Identity uh, or some other version of this. Uh, and the future is not far away before a baby leaves the hospital, their complete genetic code will be determined and given to the uh, parents on some sort of uh, uh, computer uh, chip. Uh, in Sweden, Every child born since 1950 has a blood sample stored on a little card in Sweden. It'd be possible to go back and, and genotype the entire population of Sweden, everybody born there, and understanding the genetic outcomes. Uh, this is a physicist that actually works at Tiger who put together a, a much nicer a genetic profile for himself than ended up on this slide. Uh, I, I altered it somewhat, but gave him the chance to remove his picture but he was so delighted that you'd be looking at his picture um, that he decided to leave it, which makes me think some of my adjustments might be very appropriate. Uh, but I think it's very important to note that he has 0% chance of getting ovarian cancer. Uh, so I, I, I think ge genetics is a wonderful thing. Um, I, I think the concerns as we get into trying to understand behavior is the difference between statistical references and actual causal effects. Uh, and the, the literature is becoming full of sequence variations in the genetic code linked to different behaviors. And you're going to hear some excellent studies uh, uh, with Dean. But I think we have to be very cautious about these. Uh, in the 1930s, studies done at Cold Spring Harbor led to the eugenics movement that led to some of the atrocities that happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, it's very easy to look back on science and see the foolishness. It's very difficult to look forward and see it and understand that if we're not really diligent, uh, both as scientists to ensure that only top quality science gets through, but as a society with the efforts you're making here to educate yourselves, uh, are absolutely essential. If, if you don't become educated in these issues, you're going to abdicate all the decisions uh, to politicians and to scientists. Uh, Art Kaplan just did a very interesting experiment that, that I think is, is summarized nicely on this slide. He asked the Pennsylvania legislature where their genome was. Uh, a third of them thought it was in their brains. Uh, a third of them thought it was in their gonads. Uh, <laughs> And a third didn't know. And this was a group about to pass laws on banning human cloning when they didn't understand the most fundamental uh, issues uh, that they were dealing with. And this is a very disturbing quote from an Arizona state senator who, uh, that's an abortion of a Shakespeare quote. People used to think their destiny was in their stars. Now we know it's in our genes, it's in our DNA. But I don't think you'll find any scientist that's on this program that believes in absolute genetic predeterminism. It doesn't work for mycoplasma genitalium with 300 genes. It was the single cell. It certainly is not going to work for us with 100,000 genes and 100 trillion different cells. So I think we need to be extremely cautious as we go forward. Thank you very much for your attention.
Hey, uh, um, Dr. Keller. I can't see. Yeah. Where is, uh, He's over here. He's over on my other side. Oh, here you are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ventner, uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk and, and testimony to the uh, great advantages of going private. Could you talk about some of the problems that we as a society ought to worry about, or ought to be thinking about, in response to the extent uh, of private investment, uh, to which private investment is, is driving biological research today? I, I think it's an excellent question. I, I think you have to look at sort of the history of science in this country over the last multiple decades. Before World War II, most of the funding for science was private industry. And the government only took over uh, uh, with the so-called golden age of science with NIH and DOE and NSF getting into funding. I think we would not have had the, the breakthroughs in this field, uh, Lee Hood sitting down the table from me, it would have been an obscure finding in his laboratory had he not helped start a company to make these instruments, which then went on to invest hundreds of millions of dollars a year in research uh, to go forward. I, it, it's a combination of the two approaches. I, I think it's more scientists have to have access to unique resources. Um, I think a lot of people thought of something similar to the EST approach. But the day after I thought of it, uh, flying back on an airplane from Japan with nothing to do for 12 hours, I could go in the laboratory and do the experiment because at the, on the intramural program at NIH, the scientists have the advantage of having money to go do the experiment. If you have to spend uh, a long time, a year or so, writing a grant and waiting for somebody else to like a new idea, most ideas go down the toilet. Uh, if we did not have independent money to do the homophilus genome, that experiment would have been years away from being done. So I, I view it, obviously, in my own history as an absolutely necessary component. I would not have been able to do most of the experiments that I have done and am now doing without private capital going into it. And I think there would not have been a genome project without private capital. Those speak to the advantages, but now what about the disadvantages and the, pro and the potential problems? Well, there's lots of disadvantages. The, the good news, we're a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. The bad news is we're a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so I have thousands of bosses. Um, and, uh, but I think in this case, the goals of science and the goals of commerce are totally in sync. I think that's a key part of our model that the business will only succeed if the science is spectacular. Uh, the science will only succeed if the business is spectacular uh, because it's trying to move forward the applications of uh, human genome research uh, to uh, individuals. Uh, that doesn't mean they always are, but I think it's something we strive for in our own particular case. But uh, uh, nothing comes for, for free, whether it's from the government uh, or from private industry. You know, in that same vein, one of the uh, one of the interesting things about Solera when it was first announced is uh, Craig made the um, commitment to make much of the data that we're talking about public. And what I'd like to ask you, Craig, with a thousand bosses or even with the board of directors, will you, for certain, be able to execute uh, that kind of commitment? Because it must be a temptation for a board of directors to say, look, we've, we've invested $300 million in this. You, we have other competitors out there. If we make it public, then they benefit from the investments we've made. So I'd, I'd be curious about your thoughts there. In fact, it's a question we get all the time. Uh, and, and it's a very simple one to, to answer. Uh, when this opportunity first arose and I met with what were then the Perkinoma executives, um, and they said they would give me the technology and the money to sequence the human genome uh, with our whole genome shotgun method. I, I said I would only do it under one condition, and the condition was that we were able to release the data publicly and that the company would not attempt to hold it privately. I didn't have to convince anybody. Uh, I think everybody feels with this particular genome, there is no other choice. It, it is the moral thing to do, and it's the best way to move uh, science and medicine forward. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, the stockholders had to vote for the reorganization of Perkin Elmer to form PE Biosystems and Solera. And if you go back and read the prospectus, uh, everybody that voted to do that, which was an overwhelming majority of the stockholders, did it on the basis that the genome was going to be released. So that was one of the fundamentals for forming the company in the first place. Uh, Tony White, the CEO of Perkin Elmer, uh, gave me a unique challenge. He said, fine, we'll give you the money and the technology to sequence the human genome, now come up with a business plan that allows you to uh, not blow my $300 million. Uh, that, that, that's where my creativity was put to a real challenge. Um, and the model that we're trying for is the information uh, business model. Uh, LexisNexis and Bloomberg's are organizations that take data that's largely publicly available and process it and make it usable and, and interpretable for people. And I think that's what we're going to do. When you see the massive computer infrastructure that we have, uh, I think most biologists do not yet realize what's coming and what's going to be required in, in, in the computational uh, effort going forward. And so I, I think it will be justifiable for people to subscribe totally on the basis uh, of that alone. But the, the board of directors of the company uh, and the stockholders, uh, this has been a premise from the beginning. Uh, and nobody's ever wavered on it, uh, even for one microsecond. Um, a number of questions have come up from the audience just in this vein, and one of the questions asks, who owns the patents on all these genes? So, so patents is a, obviously a, a, not a, a simple issue, except when you back off and look at the, the, the overview of how medicines and therapies get developed in this country. Uh, and it's a trade-off we make uh, as a society. Uh, the best examples come from individual genes that became medicines on their own. Uh, the best example is insulin. Uh, before human insulin became available uh, from recombinant uh, DNA techniques, most diabetics were treated with pig insulin uh, isolated from pig pancreases and slaughterhouses. And diabetics gradually became more and more resistant to the pig insulin over time. Genentech and Eli Lilly patented the human gene for insulin, and that allowed them the right to commercially develop insulin as a product. They don't own my insulin gene. They don't own your insulin gene. All they have is a right to commercially produce insulin. And if they didn't have that right in that period of exclusivity, uh, they wouldn't have invested the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars it takes to get a new drug on the market. Uh, there is no purpose that I know of for having a patent on a human gene other than trying to further the development of new medicines and new diagnostics uh, for the benefit of the American public. Uh, the fact that some people take huge financial risk, uh, more biotech companies I think go under than succeed, uh, they only succeed if they come up with a new therapeutic that really helps the population. Uh, so who owns the patents or the companies, the investors? the NIH, uh, the universities, uh, the NIH has filed more human patents than Solera has to date. Uh, I don't think that's the key issue as long as they're truly available uh, for the pharmaceutical companies to make new therapeutics. Otherwise, we won't have new medicines coming out of all the science. Um, several questions that come up from the audience in regards to um, just genomic structure, and I'll maybe combine both of these and have you or anyone else comment on them. The first one is, if there are so many genes of unknown use or genes of unknown function, how do we know that so much of DNA is so-called non-functional and can be virtually ignored? And then the, the question that goes along with this, if only about 5% of DNA is coded for, or, or codes for genes in humans, what could be the purpose of the rest of the DNA? Those are both uh, excellent questions. Um, uh, quite often, the, the DNA outside the genes is referred to as junk DNA. Uh, and I think that's mostly scientists expressing their ignorance. We don't know what it is, so it must be junk. Uh, we know it's not genes. Um, Sidney Brenner makes the unique distinction between uh, junk and rubbish. Uh, he says you store junk in your attic for some potential use later on, uh, rubbish you throw out. Uh, I, I think certainly uh, all the repetitive elements in the genome play a key role in evolution, uh, in the rearrangements of DNA. Uh, I, I assume Lee Hood will be talking about the tremendous work he's done on the T-cell receptor domains and others. 
the genomic sequence in our lymphocytes is different than the genomic sequence in the egg cells and sperm cells. Uh, we're constantly evolving and changing. Uh, the DNA between uh, the chromosomes from our two parents uh, interchanges and uh, forms new chromosome structures. The so-called junk areas are absolutely essential for that. They're essential for chromosome replication. Uh, I think we're still learning the genetic language. We know lots of three-letter words. Uh, in the last year, I learned a lot of four-letter words. Uh, there's clearly six-letter words. There's advanced punctuation. I think one of the first things we hope to find out of the genome is the tissue-specific promoters, the signals that says this gene should be expressed only in these cells in the heart and not anywhere else in, at this certain period of time. Uh, Inder Verma at the Salk Institute has used some of these tissue-specific promoters to develop new routes for gene therapy, actually using uh, an inactive AIDS virus uh, in a human tissue-specific promoter. He got the human gene to go to the right place. Uh, and it be expressed. The challenge with gene therapy is we're not just a big bag of protoplasma. We have 100 trillion different cells, and the challenge is to get the genes to go to the right place. So that's part of the junk DNA that's in there. I, I, I think it's largely an ignorance factor. Dr. Blackman, I'd like to expand on what Craig said, because we've been thinking about the genetic information, as discussed this morning, in a somewhat linear form. But in fact, the genes are expressed from a spherical body, the nucleus, the chromosomes are, have architectures which are quite complex and determined, not only through development, but um, in different stages of expression of uh, genes. And so one of the things that I think is exciting to think about in terms of what we're calling junk DNA is the architectural uh, a contribution that this DNA makes because genes do get expressed in spatial uh, ways as well, even within a single nucleus. So this might be one of the things that begins to emerge as one looks at the very exciting data sets coming out of whole chromosomes. One could maybe start thinking about those and not just the genes. Dr. Hood. Yeah, I, I would add just one thing further. In a sense, you can think about chromosomes as digital strings that contain a multiplicity of different languages. So one language is the language of the genes and the coding regions. Another language is the language of uh, the information that turns the genes on and off at the right place and the right time. There are a series of languages that are associated with the unique functions chromosomes uh, carry out in, in being the transmitter of genetic information and, and the generation of information in cells. But to really, and I agree completely with Craig, the, uh, the repetitive sequences, which can constitute 40% uh, of your genome, do play uh, fascinating and critical roles in evolution. But I think the really interesting question is, what are the other languages out there we don't understand? And it's here that there are really uh, wonderful opportunities for uh, students in computer science and applied math to think about a future of uh, deciphering the digital language of life. And a final question before we break for lunch today. Um, there was a recent news item that said that the human genome was probably going to, going to have 140,000 genes and not 100,000 as pre previously thought. Do you have any comments on that? Um, that was one of the downsides of private investment uh, in, in genomics. Uh, I, I can tell the story of early on what happened uh, uh, with the formation of human genome sciences. We just published a paper in the scientific literature saying there were 60 to 80,000 human genes. And uh, the late Wally Steinberg, who was the initial investor in human genome sciences, who was in the process of doing a uh, $125 million deal with Smith Klein Beecham, called me up screaming obscenities at me and saying, What do you think you're doing? Saying there's only uh, 80,000 human genes. Uh, and I said, why? What's, what's the problem? That's, that's what the number looks like. He goes, well, I just sold 100,000 of them to Smith Klein Beecham. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I make one, one comment? The, the, the other question that is very interesting for the audience is, is we don't know how to define a gene very well. And what has turned out to be the fascinating truth is something that in the past we would have called a single gene might have 
30 different forms that carry out different biological functions. So there are wonderful ways for amplifying information, and what a gene is is a, is a, is a matter of controversy and debate. Um, we'll reconvene here this afternoon at 1.15 for music and 1.30 for the second lecture. And I want to thank the, Dr. Venner and our participants here one more time.